we are live. It's a Wednesday afternoon. My name's Kevin Graham and welcome to your Axon Bulletin. I hope everybody is still is keeping cool in this heat wave that the radio are, are actually telling us it is now over. I don't think they're here and I don't think they're anywhere. But lads, as usual, on a Wednesday, I'm joined by Brian and James. Brian, how are you getting on? I'm very well, mate. Um, I just about survived the, the 40 degrees down here yesterday in, uh, in the, the South England. So um, that was brilliant. But I was being very cocky about it in the morning. I was like, that's only a bit of sun that we're lying about. And then I walk and I, to the sh corner shop and I come back and you think I'd run a marathon. <laughs> so I was a bit of a, a bit of a sweaty mess yesterday, if I'm honest. So I feel a little brighter today. Um, but I always, sun's always a bit, a bit dangerous for a guy as pale as me. I peel uh, Wally Sally because I'm always liable to just burst into flames like a vampire if I go in the sun too long. So, so um, I, it's cooled a bit today, so so all good, Kev. Anything like like a sweaty mess, James. I've, I'm a sweaty mess the majority of the times, and that's that's a foot actually been in a heat wave. Eh? I think it's just I think it's just part of life being Scottish, mate. Uh, it's just though we didn't get nice hot weather. We get so humid and climate. It's like disgustingly hot, and that's just a, a normal hot Scottish day. This is this is the hottest day on record in the UK history. So I'm just glad I survived it. I can know. I come on. I, I, there, 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 there's a bit of like over exaggeration with folks surviving it in that. Eh? But there is a serious thing that is going back. But hey, just just didn't be daft. Just didn't do daft things, and like you'll be fine actually, in the sun. There's quite a few of these online, a couple of hundred already, so go, go and please hit the be like and subscribe button if you haven't actually done that. Um, and what I'm going to do, lads, I'm, I'm going to actually entertain you for about 30, 40 seconds, right? I've got a wee silly and surreal poem that I'm going to do for you, and the gaffer has says that I'm allowed to do it. So just bear with me. Please hit like the new because you might not like it after this poem. So if you're going to hit like, do it just now and you can switch off after I've done this wee silly and surreal poem, which is not to be taken seriously, lads. Eh? Please don't take it seriously. It's called Pie in the Sky. My wife is upstairs parking for a holiday in the sun. I'm downstairs panicking, thinking about going on the run. I'm trying to phone the bank for them to give me a loan when I tell them the reason I need the cash. Surely I will only be alone because I went to Celtic Park on Saturday and bought a parkade pie. Now my overdraft has toppled over, took its last breath and died. It'll be worse when I take the wains because they want burgers, chips and juice. And that's got me thinking what organs I could lose. There's a man in Albania who wants my lung and liver all because I want to buy my wains a football half-time dinner. Centre plate celebrate and rub their hands with greed. Contactless and cashless, pocket and profits they didn't need. Celtics say they're blameless for a contract they did award. Excuses like a broken record and no a living wage in sight. Both parties found guilty as they sneak into the night. But please, please, please didn't boycott as the employees are no the enemy within. Just email and protest and let the revolution begin. There you go, lads. A, 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 a wee bit of... Yeah, uh, brilliant, mate. Well done. Oh. Didn't take that seriously, boys. That was just a wee bit of fun. Love but uh, aye, Everybody saw the, the, the cost of a parkade pie <laughs> at the weekend. Eh? So aye, I just thought I would have a wee bit of fun with that. Eh? There. James, you met Johnny Hayes last night. What was he saying? Uh, I, was my, 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 I said to him, I was like, I cheers for the goal at Ibrox. I got a wee smile at him. So it's, it's clear he's still got good memories of Celtic. It was just it was nice meeting a Celtic, a nice Celtic player. Brian, I always think Johnny Hayes uh, is the type of guy who would answer the question, what is your favourite Rebel song? Eh? He would I tell did. you. Eh? Uh, he'd probably sing it for you as well, to be honest. Um, I always loved Johnny Hayes as a player. I thought... Um, I thought he was just one of those guys um, that just gave absolutely everything for the, the team all the time. You always knew you were getting. Um, he may have been limited to ability at times, but I thought a, a good player that, that would run through a wall for Celtic and I always like having guys like that in the squad. Uh, and by all accounts, I love the dude as well. So 
So, uh, I fair play to James. Good you got to meet him. Aye. Um, did, did you actually go into Fourth Bank to watch Aberdeen against Stirling Albion? Did you uh, go on or did you just hang out outside to get your picture took with Johnny Hayes? Uh, unfortunately, I was on the ground. I, I finished work at 7, went straight to the ground for the game at quarter to 8 and it was 5 nearly Aberdeen at half time. So <laughs> that says how, a lot about the game. How did Liam Scales play? He came on the second half. I thought it was actually really good. He was winning a lot of the aerial jobs. He was... He was Playing as a centre half, I'm pretty sure, but he was getting to the left hand side a lot. I don't know if it's just because we were playing against Still and Albion, and they were just, every player was just sort of free roaming the park. But I thought it was pretty good. And there you go. I think some of the, have, have, have you seen the picture on Twitter of the Aberdeen fans that had that banner of no more Celtic loans? I don't know what they're getting at there. Eh? Uh, I, I, really, I really don't know what they're getting I'm sure at that there. Eh, but... would be thankful to get a loan player off the Champions. You would think. I mean, I'm, I'm sure Adam Montgomery didn't really work last year, but then Aberdeen were a bit of a mess when uh, uh, when when he went up there, Brian. Eh? So I'm not. Go- I'll be interested to see how Montgomery gets on at St. Johnson. Uh, it will be um, just on the Aberdeen thing. I can I get I get their point. I think their point is they want to have their own homegrown players and develop their own players and, and stuff like that. But at the same time, they want to do that while playing expansive football, while finishing second or, or third in the league every year. And it's, you know what I mean? It's one of those weird things. It's like, I kind of, part of me sort of almost admires them for the ambition, but I think it's misdirected. In terms of um, me, Montgomery, yeah, it'll be good to see how it gets on. I think they, I've said before, I'm not a huge fan of players for this particular Celtic team, ground and loan to other SPL clubs, because I just feel like they don't, train and play the same way we do, so I'm not sure how much it's going to benefit them. However, I think for guys like Montgomery, it's good because he will be under a lot of pressure at St. Johnson to defend, and that's an aspect of the game I think he had to work on, so hopefully he does well. Um, I, I, it remains to be seen how they, how they do if him and Scales can come back to Celtic and, and forge a career. Um, you know, interested to see how it goes long term. I'm a wee bit, as you know, a wee bit cynical about loan moves, and I think sometimes barring a few exceptions when players go on loan, I kind of think that's, that's they, need to, they need to really do something spectacular um, for, to take them in. So unless two of them are in the, the season's best 11, I'm not sure they're going to come back and walk into the Celtic side. Monty comes in, Monty, a, a regular contributor there as James gets up to shut his window. Uh, Monty well, comes in and says, the car alarm going off outside. Off outside. Uh, James, uh, Monty actually says, Christie did okay for Aberdeen. I, I think Ryan Christie, the motion of Ryan Christie's career was his spell at Aberdeen and how he pushed on at Celtic, James. Eh? So for us, we're looking for Liam, for a complete and utterly selfish point of view, we're looking for Liam Scales today. Well, uh, I just hope he'll get a chance at centre back because that's that's where I think he would be better, better placed because I don't think he was as good as he could have been at left back and there's better options at Celtic than with Greg Taylor and Bernabe. So if they could provide some competition at centre back and maybe even push for a starter one day with the one spell at Aberdeen, then that's all I can really ask for. That is all, all you can really ask for. Eh? Um, bef- before we move on, I- I'm not going to move on. Ian McLear comes in to say that my poet is awful. Uh, Daniel <laughs> Brown comes in and says it's cringy. <laughs> uh, Paul McGurk gives me a couple of wee laughing emojis and a clap and, and Niall the punk says brilliant Kevin so there you go I've divided opinion right away I love dividing opinion it's really it's really the re- right reason why I'm here uh, this is maybe no one for James but I'm actually going to br- take it to Brian first 21 years ago today Bobo Baldy signed for Celtic what's your memories of the big man I just always remember that Bobo's going to get you has been one of my favourite ever chants. And it just, it was like one of those chants that's quite smart, as well as being funny, because it really is indicative of the fear they struck into opponents. I mean, I always just think that if you were a striker, a silky striker, running towards Big Bobo, you would think twice. And I think he's probably the last, I would say, real sort of dominant, aggressive, powerful centre-back we've had, actually. Um, the Big Bang would never fit into today's Celtic team because... He was hopeless with the ball at his feet, to be fair. But he's one of those guys that you knew you were getting. And he just, as I say, I think 
I, I wouldn't say he was a cult hero because he was very successful, but he's just one of the guys you kind of had to love because you knew what you were getting. If Watts and all, you knew what you were getting, and you could always guarantee he would, he would put yourself about. I love the story Scott Brown told about him before he, they would think Scott Brown before he came to Celtic, it was his last game for Hibs, and um, Bobo absolutely done him and booted him right in the chest, and um, and then claimed that I think he got, I think I can't remember if he got sent off or he got a yellow card, but Bobo was going off his nut, and um, Scott Brown turned up for Celtic training, and Bobo pulled him up for it. <laughs> he says, "You dive, you dive, you dive." Scott Brown's like, ah, "I've still got the." Stud marks in my chest, big man. What are you talking about? Nearly killed me. So I just, uh, I, I, I love that. Uh, big man was a class act. They had this kind of sad, a slightly sadder end. Obviously, his career at Celtic with Gordon Stratton coming in and we Gordon did they fancy him. Um, and it was kind of the same for for Sutton and, and kind of Hartson as well. The, the old guard kind of moved on quite quickly. So um, that was a wee bit sad, but but brilliant player and um, great for Celtic. Loved him. James, what's your memories of Bobo? Uh, you would have just, you would have been a win, right? Enough, just uh, when when he signed for Celtic, um, he, he's a player that you wouldn't see today. I don't think. I, I don't think he would have suit the modern day today, James. Eh? Yeah, modern day, everybody's got to be able to work with the ball, the ball their feet. Especially, I think defender positions have changed the most as well. You just got to look at the fullbacks. It's all about attacking for fullbacks now. You still need to be able to defend, but it's all about attacking. On Bobo, um, I've got the top for, I think it was the season after the UEFA Cup final, I've got Bobo Baldi on the back, even though I've never watched him play. So, But you, you obviously hear the stories because everybody tells about Bobo Baldi because there's so many and the Bobo's going to get you some just been passed in for everybody and it's just, it's, it's, it'll strike fear into the opponents as well. When, when the fans are singing it, if you're coming up against a team that does really know too much about Celtic, yeah, I've got the fans belting that out there. It's just, uh, I'll make them a wee bit scared. Definitely. Uh, Paul Byrne, I don't know if it's the Paul Byrne that played for Celtic. Uh, when we played U- Juve, you realised he was twice the size of Tiram. Uh, he was, he was some, he was some lumpy a laddie. And he was quite athletic, actually, Brian. He could actually shift as well. And he had these sort of long telescopic legs that uh, sometimes did actually have a rash challenge. Let's not beat about the bush here. Um, Sean Barlow, Bobo chasing loving cans the length of Hamden and cruising him in the corner, crushing him in the corner. And Juan Douglas, we were never fearful of conceding a corner with that Celtic team. That's true, that. So good, mem- good memories of big Bobo. Now, we're going to get kind of serious for a moment before we actually go on and talk about... Um, the, the two new signings, as the tagline actually says, and um, the game t- tonight, after Borick's tribute game tonight, we're going to bring in Michael, who's going to talk about the drive that he's got to collect football t- kits in memory of his son, who committed suicide at 18 years old. Michael is a Sunderland fan, I think, Paul's actually said to me, so I'm just going to add him to the stream. Michael, welcome to our Celtic State of Mind, how are you? Hello, good evening, everybody. It's good to see you all. Oh, good afternoon, rather. Um, I'm not too bad at the moment, thanks very much. Not too bad, but um, like you say there, um, just still grieving due to the, the death of our son, Harvey, who is only 18. Um, he took his life about seven months ago now. So um, um, it's hard to for anybody to imagine really what we're going through. Um, but we want to do a lot of positives in his name, which a lot of people are doing anyway. But separately for myself, we want to create a charity in his name. We haven't got quite the name as yet, <clears throat> excuse me. So we're just getting the basics in. Now, I've reached out to a lot of people via social media, uh, Twitter, uh, such as yourself. Has anybody got any old football boots um, they don't need or new ones? Any old kit? Send them in. Send them in because we're going to use them as like a burrow bin. Because... I'm sure like where you're from and where I'm from and everywhere, there's a lot of poverty and a lot of kids can't afford to play football, whether it's the subs or whether it's um, obtaining football boots. And my son, he hated that. He couldn't get his head around the fact that kids couldn't play football because of that. So my son would give his boots away when he's when he outgrown them to the next person. And this is, and this is what the charity is about. It's about caring, it's about giving, it's about looking after local communities. 
So I've got a really big drive on doing this. I've got a big team helping me. But like I said, at the moment, it's just reaching out to anyone. Um, even some of his favourite bands have sent to sign vinyl, to raffle. So things that we can't use that will raffle to raise funds for the, the charity. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot going on there. Um, I think the first game uh, at Sunderland is against Coventry and we're having a, we're having a, a drop-off point for boots. So any Sunderland or any Coventry fans have any spare boots, they can drop them off at the Beacon of Light, which is next, next to Sunderland Football Ground, so, which is amazing. So there's a lot of people that want to help get on board. But we're soon, hopefully within the next next two weeks, we'll have a name for the charity, uh, obviously a registered number uh, and a bank account, and that and that will sort of get us, get us flowing as well. So, yeah, so it's an exciting time ahead, very busy. It gives me a lot of focus, but at the same time, it gives me a lot of comfort as well doing that, if, if I'm honest. So, yeah. It's one thing that we get told very often, Michael, uh, about this bulletin that it helped a lot of people during lockdown. Um, and it was something that started when, when lockdown started and the amount of messages that we actually get is saying that it has helped people's mental health. So what you're actually speaking about there is a, is a, is a, a cause that we hold very dear to our heart and a, a Celtic state of mind here. Your son Harvey, I mean, obviously I'm a father myself, I, I can't understand what you're going through, but I do empathise with you. I mean, he sounds a kind-hearted soul that he would give his football boots to other people. And it is very expensive to play football nowadays. And you see it, my, my, my nephew Derry, I mean, his, his mum, a single mum, it was 40 quid a month. For, for him to actually go and play with his local side. And it's a, it's meant to be a working class sport. And so and kids are now getting priced out of it, Michael, eh? Yeah. And do you know what? There's talent out there. There's a lot of talent out there on our doorstep and yet they can't play football. You, you don't you could be, be the next, you know, Ryan Christie, you know, in your case, or in me it could be could be the next Kevin Phillips, you know, or defend I'm, I'm a big defender fan, see personally. So I like defenders like Old school like Vinnie Jones, Julian Dix, Tony Adams, some of these players you might not have heard of, <laughs> some as well. Um, but that's me. But these players, these players could be out there now, but they can't afford that third, that 30, 40 quid a month subs to pay or a pair of boots. And they all want the best boots, and the best boots mm -hmm. cost money, you know, at the same time. So it's, it's something, something that needs to be done. But by doing this, it's helping, but getting people together, whether it's boys or whether it's girls, or whether it's disabled people, it's it's getting them together. And it ain't just about playing football. Like you said, it's a mental health aspect. It's more about connecting, talking to each other. Where are you from? Oh, hello. And, and this is what we want, you know? This is what we want. It's all about that as well. And, yeah, kicking a ball <laughs> at the same time. D definitely, Brian. Eh? We, 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 we've spoke about mental health on this on our bullet and another bullet and plenty of times, eh? And it's something that we will always try and highlight. And as Michael says, it is about talking. And we've always says that anybody in the comments and that we've got a great wee community in the comments and that is here. And what we'll do, Michael, is we'll get a link to for if anybody wants to send you boots. But bits of equipment, and we'll keep everybody updated when you get the bank account and that up and running. I'm sure we'll do do work with you to actually raise funds for Har Harvey's charity. Brian, it's something that we always say that you need to talk about, and this is that we, we really enjoy it. And I'm not going to mention the contributors, but there is contributors on here that we've helped who themselves, and the reason they come on a Celtic state of mind was to improve their mental health in the place where they were during lockdown. And that's what we're here for as well, because it is good to just come on and have a blather, ain't it? Absolutely yeah. is, and, and the, 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 key, the key thing is is talking, um, it, it's it's okay to not be okay. I know that's a bit of a slogan now, but it is. And and you talk about football being a working class sport for working class boys and, and girls, and a chance for people to connect. And it's so important, especially if, when people have had such a period of isolation. Um, and, and I just think anything um, that that draws attention to that is key. And and Michael, I think you know it's incredibly brave of you. It it it. Do this in the name of your son, and I, and I commend you wholeheartedly. It's, as I say, I'm a father as well, and um, I think you're incredibly brave. And I think it's such a good cause, and I, and I know for a fact there'll be so many people that watch this, that watch other podcasts, that, that hear about it, that will be delighted to contribute. So, so God bless you and your family. 
thank, thank you, uh, thank you for your kind words. Thank you very much. They are they are very comforting. Thank you very much. James, you, you're one of the younger generations that's on Axom as well, eh? Uh, me, me and Brian are talking from it, but I'm going to say I'm a middle-aged man. Brian probably will not class himself as a middle-aged man, but you, you, you're a young lad, and it seems to be affecting young lads even more. There was Harvey, who was only 18, and James, you're 20, or you just turned on 21. I've almost your 21st birthday. Brother. I'm 18. You're 18? Oh, you're 18. There you go. Um, so you were the same age as Harvey, but it seems to be more and more, unfortunately, more and more common in, in, in lads your age, James, eh? Yeah, I've had friends that have opened up to me and the weight off their shoulders that they get just from speaking to someone is tremendous. So if anybody in the chat who's suffering from mental health, the best advice I can give you is to talk to someone. The weight you'll get off your shoulders and you, you're not going to be a burden to them either. You don't want to feel like a burden for just talking to someone. Make sure to speak to people. Mm -hmm. Michael, um, I mean, you're obviously quite busy with the charities and that. You're, you're getting an awful lot of love in the comments. Scotty comes in and says, God bless, bless Harvey. Uh, sold for a pound, so sad, mates. Fought with you and your family. Drew comes in and says, God bless. Paul Mack, God bless as well. FTB, Michael, pray, God bless you and your family as well. There's hundreds of messages coming in. Uh, showing support, so you will get a lot of love and support from that from the Axon community, mate. Um, what, what, what's your overall plans with, with the charity? You're just going to see where it goes and just see how what, how much good you can do for the local community in, in your area, or do you want to be at national? Yeah, I'm not too sure at the minute, to be honest. Um, it's all based around Harvey. Harvey was a very caring young lad, like I say, he used to give his boots away and stuff. He wouldn't want to be play football so our aim is to get kids into football you know if they can't afford the subs then we may be able to help with that once the charity gets running you know if they haven't got boots we can lend them boots um so yeah who knows where it goes it it, it, it could it could take off you know it's, we've got some ideas especially locally harvey <clears throat> excuse me harvey uh, went to university in, in exeter and he played for a local team there uh, called exeter Exeter to Royals, uh, you can get them on Twitter, Exeter Royals, and they have done wonders for Harvey, and I mean wonders. This season, they're changing their kit to red and white stripes in honour of Harvey in Sunderland. Got for Harvey on the back of the shirt, they've got the A team, the, the Broken Hearts on the badge. Uh, they're doing a skydive in his name. They're doing wonders. Um, up here, I'll be giving out trophies to his his local grassroots team. So there's a lot of positive stuff going on and these things will happen every year. Um, there's a museum here called the Arthur Wharton Foundation, mm -hmm. uh, which you may or may not have heard. Arthur Wharton was the first black player to play for Sunderland. Uh, sorry, Darlington. <clears throat> Excuse me. So they've got a big trophy in his honour. Uh, inside there, they've got Harvey's name printed on the wall. And that's permanently there, which is lovely. So it's a nice place to go and reflect. Um, this place is letting us store any boots that we get or kits because obviously if we get a lot we need a bigger place and it's letting us store it there so we're going to work with him going forward uh, but going back to what you said excuse me I do talk a lot going back to what you said um, it's probably going to start start locally start where he lives Darlington and then we'll just see where it goes from there. his favourite team was Sunderland you know I've got a lot of contacts up there as well we're helping out so it may spread there. Who knows? But the minute we want local kids here, where he's from, to, to get to play football, boy, girl, disabled, no barriers. Just here's some boots. Here's some kits. You know, get on. I've had a, a lot of a lot of donations. It's from the general public on Twitter. I've had uh, donations from Tom White, who's a Sky Sports presenter. He sent me a load of stuff. Um, you know, there's people from Sunderland. Just the general public just sending me boots and just to use and, and, and stuff to sell. If I can't use it, obviously I'll raffle it for for the charity. So yeah, lo at first locally. And if it if it expands in, that's that's great. 
It's brilliant. What we'll do, uh, what we'll do, Michael, is when you get the the there's a lot of people in the in the comments asking how can they donate. So when you get the bank account and that set up, we'll 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 make sure that we publicise it where people can donate. If you're in the Darlington area or, or the the Sunderland area and you can get along, drop the books uh, drop the books off. As I say, as I say, Michael, we will we'll, we'll guarantee that we'll promote it for you. And thank you for coming on a Celtic State. I mean, I've just got to ask you, I've got to ask you a football question to maybe kind of lighten the mood. Aidan Magidi, what's your thoughts on Aidan Magidi being a Sunderland fan? Yeah, I, 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 yeah, he done well. He, great free kicks. When we got him, I was so excited. Brilliant, you know. I thought he done well. I thought he had a dodgy season. But... Um, Overall, I liked him, yeah, but I thought Pulley was ready to go. You know, he's gone to High, high Burning, I believe. He's uh, went to Hubs, yes, I. I. I did like, I did like him as a player. He, he was great watching him live. He was, them, he was so quick on them feet, especially for League One. You know, you're talking League One here, not Remley. So for League One, he, he was, he was brilliant. His feet was great. He scored some great goals. I think it's just his injuries held him back, I think, you know. And then I think he fell out with Lee Johnson at some point, we think, uh, where he didn't play for a while. Um, but then I heard, he, obviously, he's left to go to High Burning with Lee Johnson. Uh -huh. So we'll see how that goes. But um, I think that could be a, a not not bad signing, I don't think so. I think for him, uh, I mean, keep, keep him fit. Keep him fit. He'll be all right. Brian, uh, do you think Aidan McGeady fulfilled his potential? And I, I, I didn't mean that in disrespect to Sunderland there. I just mean for the way that he broke into the Celtic side and then the move to Spartak Moscow. It's hard to say. It's hard to grade what you see success, right? So if I was in McGeady and I played for Celtic and then went to Russia and played for Everton and Sunderland and had a football career and made a lot of money, I would say I'm very successful, right? Mm -hmm. But if you look at the potential he had compared to where he might have been... It, I mean, I remember him well, I, I, and I got to know him when he played for Celtic, and I, I actually thought he was a lovely guy. He got bit a bad rep, but actually a lovely guy, and he had so much talent, and you just wonder if it was the, you know, the the moves he made. It never quite worked out because I mean, even when he went to Everton, it seemed like it was almost a bit bad player at times. And I think he's maybe it was, I don't know if it was an attitude thing or a, a training thing or or whatever. But so I don't think in terms of where he could have went based on his potential, it was maybe a success, but you can't say he's not had a successful career, if that makes sense. It'll be interesting, James, to actually see how he does at Hibs, eh? Yeah, I was at the Bonnie Rig Rose Hibs game at the weekend, I saw him oh. miss the penalty, he was getting jeers for the fans the entire time, so I don't know if that was what put him off, but uh, I, hope, I hope he does well at Hibs. As long as he does the score against us, then. As long as he does the score against Celtic, I hope he does the he play well against everybody else, bar everybody, <laughs> bar Celtic. Michael, uh, we'll let you get going, but thank you very much for being brave and coming on. And we'll leave the last word to Lubo Maestro. Good luck, Sunderland. Do it for Harvey. Michael, thank you very much, and I'm sure we'll be in contact again, mate. Thank you very much. Yet yeah, anything, oh, I'll be in touch, no problem. Cheers, guys. Take Thank care. you, Michael. Cheers. Everybody, we'll put we'll put the details in, in, in the show notes and on our social media and that. And and uh, please, if you can if you can help out Michael and help out Harvey's charity, please 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 actually do it. Now, lads, we've signed two guys in the space of ten minutes yesterday. The Cel the, the Celtic um, social media team didn't they half have their work cut out yesterday. So I think we'll, we'll start talking about Aaron Moy first. And there's been a split down the middle of the Aaron Moy camp. Some takes have been completely ludicrous and other ones have been very, very sensible. There seems to be two camps. There's one camp who thinks he's a setting coming a willow flood. And there's another camp who actually believe that he's the best thing to come out of Australia since in excess released kick in the late, in the late 80s. James, where do you sit on the Aaron Moy signing? You're the only guy like this, right? I'm telling you, right, but I'm sitting right in the middle, <laughs> right on the fence. <laughs> I, I don't know how to feel about it because um, I would have rather we signed a younger player. I'd be lying if I didn't say that. But when he was at Brighton, when he was at Huddersfield, I thought he was a very impressive player. He was very highly rated, and unless his standards have dropped massively in this two or three years over in China, then he can still 
be a first team ready player for Celtic, they can still be a challenger and if not start for Celtic. And that's just exactly what you're looking to sign. But as I said, I would have added someone younger and we've said in the podcast over the last few weeks that we need a powerhouse, a Winyama type player. So I think Aaron White is a good player, he's a good signing, but I don't know if it's what I wanted. I, th- I think, uh, Brian, I think a lot of the negativity comes with there's a realisation eventually that we get every that we get every summer that we're no going to get everything that we want and we're no going to make maybe that push on to be a Champions League team, whatever that whatever that push on's got to be. We've got something in our head that we needed six players. We've got something in our head that we need four players in maybe the calibre of uh, Cameron, Vickers, uh, Cameron Vickers and Jota. Then we get to a point, every transfer window, when we realise that kick on's not going to happen. And I think that's where a lot of the negativity came from for Aaron Moy not against Aaron Moy the player, just the realisation of the financial restrictions that the club are putting on the manager or the other financial that, restrictions that they were, were actually working with him. I think it's a really good signing uh, I, um, I I don't really I, I sort of understand a wee bit people's disappointment I just don't agree with it, if that makes sense it feels like when it's say it's Christmas morning and you've got ten presents to open and you want a PlayStation and the first present you open is a pair of trainers or a pair of slippers and you're raging and you just, I just wanted a PlayStation and you're stumbling about the house. You've not addressed the presents yet. We've still got plenty of time in the transfer window. Just because we've got Aaron Moy doesn't mean we're not going to get another player in. And I think the the other thing to consider is I don't think there's any way he's been signed as a this a defensive midfielder. We've been craving. I think he's signed this. I mean, if you look at it, we've lost Rogic, we've lost, we've lost Beaton. So now I think now we've replaced Rogic with Moy. And I still think we'll look to replace Beaton. So I think we need to just take a second a wee bit and, and just sort of wait. There's plenty of time. In terms of him as a player himself, um, if you look at it right, he's not going to cost us all well, he's not cost us any money. He's not going to cost a lot of money in wages. He knows Ange. He knows how Ange plays and trains, so he's going to slot straight in. On ability wise, he's a very, very good footballer. He's still got, you know, a, 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 a real strong range of passing. In fact, probably outside of um Celtic, he's probably still going to be the best or one of the best passers in the league. I don't think he's going to start every week. I think he's probably an option in the bench. And to be honest, I'd said that I think it was either last week or on Friday that the midfield threes is going to be say McGregor, Hitati, O'Reilly. I think that's probably the strongest three. I think Turnbull could come in and out for there. But other than that, it's a bit of a drop with Idiguchi and McCarthy. So I think if, you know, O'Reilly comes off for um, Moy and Hatati comes off for Turnbull, I think that's quite a strong bench to have and a good option. So I can't really see any sort of massive downside to it. Um, I'm not you know, going to get Moy printed in the back of my T-shirt, but... At the same time, I think it's a good piece of business. I think it's sensible. I think he knows the manager. He knows how we play. He's, he's a good footballer, and he doesn't cost us anything. I, I can't see the, the downside personally. Um, I, so I was a bit surprised with the division it caused. I think it's just the fact that maybe we were expecting some sort of, you know, midfield destroyer. But there's nothing to suggest we're not going to get that. James, I'm going. I'm, I'm going to. I'm going to bring in Paul Byrne again here, eh? and I will bring in that comment that I brought up with my steak afterwards. Actually, eh, I think that shows if Celtic identify. I think it shows if Celtic identify that caliber of player, they will spend the money. It's not their fault if they can't get them. Then move for option two. If you're looking at it sensibly and from a football point of view, and you dis- and and you extract all the emotion from the signing. One thing I thought about was it maybe looks like the long term option that we wanted for a centre de- defensive midfielder is not there, or the club is not willing to take the gamble on it. It's not there this window, and the club's maybe having a look at other options, younger options, maybe 18, 19, to try and integrate into the squad. And Aaron Moy presented himself as 
and Ange Postacoglu's eyes as a low-risk guy that he knows what he's going to get, the same as he knew what he was going to get with Kyogo and Atai, etc. and Maeda. I think if you, if you take the emotion out the sign, and you have to look at it that way. I don't think there's any other way that you can look at it that longer term we will address that position, but in the short term, Ange's went for a safe option and the yeah. Cubs went for a safe option. Yeah, there's no sort of risk or gamble to it either because we've got on a free transfer and he's a good player. So surely the, the signs are pointing to that it should work out. I think just a lot of the frustration from some fans comes from the fact that, oh, we're linked for two weeks with Vinicius Sosa, tall, massive, Brazilian guy, 23 years old, the sort of player that a lot of fans have been crying out for us to sign for four or five years, and then we've ended up with Aaron Moy. That's not me trying to say that Aaron Moy's a bad player, but it's just the calibre of the two players. They, they're both different types of players. Aaron Moy's a smaller player, Vinicius Sosa's absolutely massive. Mm-hmm. Uh, 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 as... Moy's not a glamorous, sexy signing that us fans crave, or some fans actually crave Brian A. And I think that's sometimes a problem. You've got the football, the football manager's scouting system that's out there. Now I noticed your tweet this morning about football cards, guys judging signings and football cards and then football managers, which is utterly bizarre. I'll I'll judge Aaron Moy and what he does in a Celtic jersey. And Absolutely. I said that about Ange Postacoglu as well. I'll judge him what he done as a Celtic manager. I don't care what he's done before. I just want to. I just care what he'll actually do in a Celtic jersey. And I'm more than willing to actually welcome him. But I, there is part of me, part of me, quite not disappointed. Disappointed? No, no the road. This will uh, shrug my shoulders. Gone. Aye. Well, this is what Celtic do. Maybe the boss has changed, but the old boss is still there. We are, we are, we are always going. To, we are always going to have a budget, and we're never going to go across that budget. And we are just going to make sure that we've got enough to win the Scottish League and hope that we become a greater sum than our parts and do well in Europe. But then saying that, Brian, saying that, our main rivals are a team that got to a European final. So we've got to compete with them. And if they can get to a European final, we've got to have a squad that can probably do the same. Yeah, as I say, I just think... I. So let, let, let me phrase it this way. See, this time last summer, was anybody saying, oh, we need to get a guy like Cameron Carter Vickerson? They really knew him. He was a guy who'd been in loan for a Premier League club. He had six other clubs. He was almost a journeyman loan e guy for his age. Nady was saying at the start of last year's transfer window, oh, we need to get Jota in. Jota's the type of player we need. We never knew that until he signed. Nady knew who Kyogo was, even if they pretended they did. And look how that turned out. So I don't think we can then be looking at this transfer window and saying, right, we want this guy, that guy, that guy. There's guys we're excited to be linked with, fair enough. But I don't get this idea of being hugely disappointed. I think I would have been disappointed if I ever signed Jota and Carter Vickers permanently now, because I know the Carabella player. Um, but it's the same way with um, uh, Bernabe coming in. We don't really know much about him, but we're taking it faith he's going to be good. We know Moy's a good player. He's low risk. So I, I'm kind of, I said, I'm not trying to be intentionally positive, but I just I can't necessarily see the downside to it. And I don't think, um, to your point about the, the old system, Celtic are never, ever going to spend an exorbitant amount of money. Even Anne said that in one of his first press conferences. He was aware he was never going to have this open checkbook to, to sign players. He has to build players and build teams. And I think he will, but that takes time. And the thing about it is, just be, even if he spent, say Anne spent £40 million this transfer window, it doesn't necessarily guarantee he's going to win the Europa League or win the Champions League or get to that point. Maybe if he spends six, 60 £70 million every year for 10 years, you get to that point. But that's not viable. So I can't be too critical of that the money spent, because I actually think we spent fairly well, and, and again, I'll caveat everything I'm saying by saying, we've still got plenty of time in the transfer window, we still might sign another, you know, so-called marquee sign, and a big player. Um, I suppose we're going to talk about um, Maurice Jens, but Nadine was talking about him weeks ago, he kind of came into blue, and, but because he's younger, everybody's kind of excited, but Moy, even though he's proven Nadine's excited, 
it seems a, it seems an unusual sort of dynamic to me, but I say I, I don't think we can be too critical on a Celtic this transfer window. Um, and I've been super critical of them in the past, as you know, Kev, for being lack of ambitious. But I think we, we seem to back the manager, the type of player he wants. I think he's working with our system. And the thing is, as well, just before I pass back, I don't think, you know, having more experience in the squad is a negative thing either. Because Moy coming in, he can help other players through. He knows Angie, knows the system. Obviously, you've got Harry Kula in there as well, another big Aussie. You get, he can contribute other things off the park as well. So, again, I just think there's loads of, loads of stuff to be positive about without being particularly worried about the, the tactics we're employing in this transfer window. I, it's, not, it's not the tactics. Just when you mentioned pass back there, eh? it's 30 years today that the pass back rule was brought in. That you couldn't have passed back to the goalie. So there you go. James, you yeah. can never remember the days when they used to be able to pass back to the goalie, but that was 30 years today, eh, FIFA brought in that, that rule. AJSC technology. The kick-on might have been to buy four or five Jota or CCV level signings, but that's a 25 million investment on top of those two. So not realistic. And I think... It's not realistic in Scotland, but I think for somebody like me who wants European success, you have to have the structure there. And I've got to have full trust in the Celtic implementing the structure correctly and having the coach to implement the structure correctly and having the backup that we need to actually gain every single bit of advantage that we can. What I'm sitting here, uh, what I'm sitting here actually hoping for now is we're, n we're probably never going to get it with the transfers, James. We were never going to get that. We were never going to get, as Brian says, a 40, 50 million pounds spend. But I'm actually sitting here hoping that Ange Postacoglu can give us so many 90 minutes in Europe that makes us believe that we can actually change the world. That's what we're hoping for. Eh? That's all we should really be hoping for. Eh? We were never going to get it with marquee signings. Yeah, we've been saying for the weeks in the podcast, we're looking for progress in Europe. We were talking about our goals for next season. So you want to be able to give these big teams a, a good run for their money. And I just hope Celtic don't see being able to challenge these teams as a sell to invest sort of operation. We, we don't need to sell one or two good players to sort of improve on our positions in the squad. You want to be able to have everybody on the park to properly give a go. Definitely, I'm going. I'm going. I'm going to bring up this comment for Peter, and I know Peter's Australian, and I didn't see this being a problem, Peter. But I, I, I know what you're actually getting at here. If our moist passport says Netherlands and not Australia, what would the reaction be? Has he got a point, Brian? I know the point that he's trying to make, but I don't think the fact that Aaron Moy, well. Let's have a look at it. The only reason that Aaron Moy is at Celtic is because of the Australian connection. But I know what Peter's getting at. If we were bringing in a 32-year-old free transfer with the experience, the number of World Cup appearances is Aaron Moy, the number of international caps is Aaron Moy, the English Premier League experience is Aaron, Aaron Moy's actually got, would the reaction have been different? It's hard to say. I think that, if I'm being honest, I think it would now. Because we're... The, we feel the transfer system sort of has changed and it's shifted towards a sort of younger, more energetic um, sort of what's the best way? It's sort of young, ambitious signings. Guys don't really know of, we're kind of excited by him, we're trusting the manager. And I think, actually what I think is, the reaction to Aaron Moy is almost a case of, like you said Kev, people thinking, oh Celtic have went backwards and we're signing like a McCarthy again. Or we're signing you know, a Freddie Lundberg, again, just someone to have because they happen to be known. And, and I don't think that's actually accurate. And I don't think it's anything to do with the fact he's Australian. I mean, he played the Premier League, played in Scotland. Yeah, he spent a bit of time in China. And he is only 31. But I, I, I have to say, I, I get the guy's point, but I would say that's inaccurate. It's not something I would agree with. I don't think it would matter, I think, if, if it was, I don't know, if it was some other player that used to play in the Premier League that's now playing in China and we bring them in, I think the reaction would be probably much the same. Um, and I think the I think as well though, what will balance it is if we spent three million on Aaron Moy, then I could see people's point. But I think it's 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 a totally risk free signing, and I don't think the fact he's he's an Australian is is anything to do with it. I think it's maybe his age and the sort of 
the perceived lack of ambition with the signing. I think he's the issue in his nationality. I think Brian's spot on there, James. I think he is spot on. I think it's just people realising that Celtic are not going to change the habit of life thing. Uh, have people actually been comparing Aaron Moy to Will Flood? No, I just don't. <laughs> I, just, I, I just used that because both of them have got bald. Both of them are baldy. Eh? I just it was the first it was the first Celtic player I thought eh, that I saw when I saw him holding up the jersey. Yes, it was Will Flood, and I'm not being serious when I made that comparison. See, Aaron Moy is he's still a good player. He's unless he, I said earlier, unless his standards have dropped off a cliff and, since the two years he was away from the Premier League, then he should still be a good player for Celtic. And to have a player that has quality as a sort of rotation player is only going to improve the squad. I saw a comment in the chat that was something along the lines of another experience, but it's only experienced players go out the door this sort of summer beat on and Rogic going out. Bring that another experience head isn't going to hurt. It's, it's not going to hurt whatsoever, and uh, the comments are backing that up. And Steve, Steve, Steve O'Matt, is that you, Steve O'Matt? Man, what, what size of guns you've got in your avatar there? If that's if that is you, you must work out, mate. Uh, Moy makes more, more, more sense than McCarthy. The one year, the, the one year we are an option of an extension is what McCarthy should have got. It's a win win. Celtic reported it as a two year deal, though, eh? I'm sure the Celtic website reported it as a two-year deal. That's on the bit that I've read. Uh, Darren Moy. Summer of 2023. Oh, so it is a year. Uh, it's an it's an option. It must be a year with an option then. And uh, Brian O'Neill. Moy is a model pro. He's not a big risk and brings a lot of positives to his squad. That's what backs you up, James. And Alex Burrow, a, normal, uh, a regular contributor, says, marquee signings guarantee... Nothing. So he had to he had to spread that over two comments, and that and, and that that's true as well. Uh, Sheila Scott or Sheila Scott, not being negative, but I think we're still too slight as a team. Brian, you you mentioned uh, Moritz Jens there. He's a big fella, eh? Yeah, yeah. Strong physical presence, um, good height at the back as well. Uh, really aggressive in the tackle. Um, see the point about the physicality, it's something that I was sort of pushed back on a wee bit last year as well because people said well, we were bullied at times. I disagree. I think what happened was the midfield was disrupted at times and people were marked. I don't think we were battered off the wall. I think what, what, what we don't have is, it keeps coming back to this point about the strong centre defensive midfielder, the Victor Wanyama type. We don't have that in the squad. And I think part of the, sorry to go back to Moy, but I think part of the disappointment is because you, because people are looking at him and thinking he's the one that's going to perform that role. I don't think I don't know if he's really ever played as a sort of ball winning midfielder. I think he's played slightly deeper at times. He's always played sort of middle to front in a sort of O'Reilly Turnbull slater role. Um, so I think uh, one of the commenters, I think it was Danielle. If it wasn't Danielle, I apologise, but she said that she thought we were getting a, a defensive midfielder, and we still might. Animoy isn't it that. So that's just the thing I wanted to say about that. And Again, the physicality, I think it's a wee bit overrated. I just think that it's the only area where we say I think we're physically, we could be accused of being physically vulnerable is that holding midfield role because Callum McGregor's not the biggest. But then there was Scott Brown. I think if you get Turnbull and uh, O'Reilly, I think are both six foot. Carter Vickers is only, I think he's just six foot, but he's an absolute unit. You know, Ralston's not a big guy, but he's incredibly physical. Um, Yakimakis up front is, is an absolute powerhouse. Miki Ogo is slight, but he's a warrior. I've never seen him, you know, he doesn't get bullied off, he gets tackled, he gets back up, he puts himself about. So, uh, Maeda as well, he, he runs so fast and so perfect. People, would they be better players if they were six foot four? I, I don't think so. I think they just the concern is in maybe certain areas, that being the, the defensive midfielder and the centre back. And as you say, the, the big gens come in, hopefully he, he provides that physicality at the back. Um, but more so what I hope he provides is that aerial threat that Julien provided, especially in the opposition box, because we don't score a lot of headers. That's where my criticism would be, as opposed to the physicality. We're not the greatest in the air, especially in attack, so I think that's something that needs to be improved. Um, but again, I, just, I want everybody to calm down. We don't know how it's going to look at the end of the transfer window and as the season progresses. And as I say, we were, we were relatively, if people want to say we were small last season, 
and I don't think that was the reason we we Bodo Glunt scalped us last year, and it wasn't because they were bigger and stronger. It's no, it's because they were better. Right. <laughs> because so, uh, 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 Aberdeen, for example, um, all big physical players, Mullow, and we, we slapped him about. So it, it's this idea of, you know, and people compare them to, you know, to, to the Rangers and say, oh, they, they bullied us. They won. They, what, they kicked us that? off the park, Brian. And that's a I worry. That's what, that's that's what no, everybody that's not about being physical. That's about right. being nasty. That's about referees no that's that's a bit they they'd have still been doing that if we were all built like tanks. It doesn't make any aye. difference. So I, I just think that there's a bit of a narrative forming that I, I have to say I don't agree with. I think it's perception and it's myth. And it's the fact and it's based on two Rangers games where like we drew one and we were we were okay for a period, then they came on top. But that game they had to win, they threw everything at us at the last 25 minutes and still didn't win. Uh, the, and the cup semi final, we had a Bobby Madden masterclass, and how the boy Lundstrom never got sent off with six bookable offences will never be explained to me. Without and again, sorry, Kev, just to, just to, to add to that before you move on, the, the game where we smashed them at Parkhead, right, everyone's favourite game for last season, Hatati is like five foot seven, five foot eight. He ran that show. If you're mm-hmm. a foot taller, would that have made it a better game? So, I think it's just things to remember. I think sometimes it's easy to focus on the negatives and say, this is what we like, as opposed to this is what we offer, which is a real life lesson as well. Don't think about the negatives, think about the positives. Definitely. Steve O'Mac comes in and says, that indeed it is, mate. I'm in the gym now, actually, with Axon Fuel in the training. Rangers would have kicked him about even. I mean, we, we could, we could, the narrative is we could probably do about six or seven Steve O'Macs, man, in our team. <laughs> James. It seems that uh, Jens already knows quite a bit about Celtic. His best pal is Matt O'Reilly. His interview was very good. He managed to get Peter Grant in. He managed to get Andy Tom in. And he managed to say that he was he was linked with Celtic last year. Matt O'Reilly, his best pal. And he, and he mentioned the word, it seems to be destiny. Are we going to get a fairy tale with this guy that it was meant to be? Well, he's setting everything up for a fairy tale, <laughs> so hopefully he can deliver on it. My favorite, I enjoyed the interview, but my favorite part about the whole sort of signing and unveiling was on his Instagram. He gave a, a special shout out to CEO Mr. Michael Nicholson and his Instagram <laughs> post. I particularly enjoyed that. But he signed from, is it Lorien or Lorien? I'm not too sure the actual pronunciation of it, but it seems like he's going to be a squad player. But again, like Aaron Moy, is going to provide real competition. That's Exactly what we need in centre back in my opinion. I don't think we need to spend six million pounds on a new centre back as much as we could better spend it in different positions at the club. We don't need to spend that much money on a centre back. They apparently mm-hmm. had a bad season last season, but we should only really try and judge them on how they play at Celtic, as we've been saying. I mean Edward had a poor season on one at Toulouse, and then Aye. he came in has been one of our best players the last 10, 15 years. I think Lorien were absolutely rank rotten last year as well, Brian. Eh? I don't think they had a very good season. So I'm not going to judge it. I mean, it's like us judging uh, John Joe Kenny and Shane Duffy and <laughs> coming, to our, coming to our club that season. Uh, I mean, we are playing in the John, Joe, the John Joe Kenny Cup in November when we go to Australia, right enough. But Shane Duffy, you look at Shane Duffy last year for Brighton, utterly and peerless, man. He was, he was utterly fantastic. He was just the, the right guy at the wrong time. And a lot of players are like that. Absolutely. And what we, we need to uh, remember is uh, he was linked last year, Jens. Aye. So Post the also had his eye on him and he's pushed to get him in. Um, I think Jens even admitted that in his, his interview, he said. Um, so he, what you're looking at there is he sees and sees the potential in a player there. And he's going to try and mould him and get him to train and play his team plays. And that is what makes it work. As you say, I, I mentioned Jota and Carter Vickers that when they, you know, set the world alight before they came to Celtic. They weren't good, not they weren't good players, but they, they found a home here and they found an environment they can thrive. Look at Ralston. You know, everyone in the world dropped him off. And then Ange came in and looked what he did with him. So I think if Ange sees it, we trust in him. And I say the same about, about Moy. One of the things I liked about Big Jens in his interview, um, was the fact that he will a couple of things. One, the fact they said he was Matt O'Reilly's best pal. <laughs> and I just think, imagine they two in a night out. If I was ever out with my missus and I saw they two, I would run it, I'd move to another pub because you <laughs> have no chance, would you? 
you should leave you. Um, and I like the fact you mentioned because sometimes when players sign for Celtic, they're, they're obviously brief before to say, "Well, I did watch Celtic games, or I've always known about the club, and it's a bit cookie, cookie cutter." But I love the fact you mentioned Peter Grant and Andy Tom. I thought, uh, like my new day for me, I love that. He obviously, he obviously I know. does know a bit, and and I think he seems to buy. It seems the fact he knows Matt O'Reilly and Paul Scullin knows then by extension what type of guy he is. He'll fit in well to the team, and, and I think he'll be a success. And I, I actually think he'll he'll come in to a fight strongly for competition. I don't think he'd be there to, to, to make up numbers. Um, I agree with you there. And, and when you're talking about his interview as well, you get signing bingo, don't you? And you usually mention the Sabutio team. I had, I had Celtic as my Sabutio team when I was a laddie or something like that. But when he was mentioning Peter Grant, the first thing that was going through my mind was, I reckon he already knows the field's half and right. I reckon he already knows that song is, so he's going to fit in well in the dressing room and hopefully we can actually turn him into a player and hopefully, I mean, it's a loan with an option to buy, James, and we've done all right out of that last season. Like, how much the fears? Nah, we don't know. That that hasn't been a... That hasn't been, hasn't been disclosed, but welcome the two, two guys and I say I will only judge them on what they do as a Celtic player. I won't judge them on anything else. Um, I'm just having a wee look at the comments. Somebody came into the comments there. I've lost it to say that Winfield bet Bodo, Bodo Glunt last night in the Champions League qualifiers. I don't know if that... Yeah, they did 1-0. They, they bet them. I was that in, the February result for us like, even worse. Was that in Belfast, James? Yep. I reckon Bodo will take four or five off them in Norway. Guaranteed Bodo will take four or five off them in Norway. Um Brown Warrior, usual. Kev, have you tried drinking sweet beachums before you host acts on Cheer Up? We are champions and in the Champions League. I'm glad that we're champions, but I never look forward to the Champions League. I never look forward to the Champions League because I do fear that we get some hidings, but I'm willing to have the hope that Ange Poster Coglu gives us some 90 minutes that we will never, never forget. And somebody else comes in and asks, Stephen Haggerty comes in and asks, Kevin, are you sure you're a ton? I don't know Ken, but that's coming for. Lads, we're playing Legia Warsaw the night and the Holy Goalies testimonial game. Uh, right, I'm going to get the negativity out the way right away. Right? I didn't want Arthur playing in goals for Celtic. I, 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 didn't, I didn't want any of this rubbish when he actually plays 45 minutes for Celtic. Which has been which has been spoke about. Let's do it as a test. If he's going to play for Celtic, well, it's the last five minutes. I, I, I didn't. I, I didn't want it turning into an absolute farce. I want to see. I want to see the team get a decent run out the night against a decent, decent side. And I didn't want any of this nonsense. Like I remember the Peter Beardsley testimony. No, it was Alan Shearer testimony. We had to give away a penalty so he could score. Or was that the Peter Beardsley? Can I remember? Roy Keane as well. Remember Roy Keane's? Uh, he done one half for Celtic, one half for Man U. Um, I was a testimony as well. Or was that a testimony? Or just a chat? It was a test. I, I can't remember what one it was. The best ones in Newcastle was a very, very drunk at the actual time, and I can't remember what testimonial it was. I think it was Beardsley. I'm sure it was Beardsley. Anyway, it's a decent test. The, cl uh, the club have, are using this for the team to get used to actually travelling to midweek games and come back so they get into a sort of routine, James. Ah. Uh, Fully expect to see a strong team for 60 minutes tonight. I fully yeah. expect the same as what we've done against Blackburn. The Blackburn game, once we made the changes, Blackburn became the better team. But I thought up until about that, we absolutely wiped the flare with them. And I would expect to see that again for Celtic tonight. We'll see virtually a first 14 in the six in the in the first 60 minutes, James. Yeah, because like yeah, Warsaw, well, they're a, a sort of bigger European team. You would expect to see like yeah, Warsaw well, in the you know, playing competitions like that. I'm pretty excited for the game because Arthur Boruch, he he was my first ever favourite Celtic player growing up. Him and him and Nakamura were my first ever favourite players, so it's a bit crazy that he's retiring now, but I'm just really excited to see what happens. We need to go with a strong team, as Kevin said. And is there still issue tickets for the game? So I saw that there was issues with the price and people weren't too happy with the price. And I don't know if that's they got result. it reduced. I think so. I think I, I think they got it reduced. Eh, so eh, I, I have, I have a. Eh, I, I, I have a. Eh, whoops, I'm going to say that I've actually, I've actually forgot what was what was going to actually say there. Um, aye, Brian, what do you expect to see tonight? And I'll try and remember what I was going to say. 
I, so I kind of I kind of think what, what you said. I think we see a, a strong team um, up to a point, and he maybe give some fringe players a, a game. I, I think we've been really smart this preseason in terms of the teams we've picked, the the level we've picked in the travelling. I think it's been quite shrewd. Um, I have to disagree with you slightly, Kevin. That I can't wait for the the Champions League games. This, but I think that's more of a caveat on I can't wait this year because I still think we're going to take a couple of scalps. Um, but I think it's about progress. And uh, I've got to say, I saw some a lot of kind of negativity after the Blackburn Rovers game. I thought we battered them. I thought some of the so did that. Play was excellent. I really like. I was so like obviously Derek Saints didn't lose a goal, right? Brilliant. But I thought we were excellent. I really, really do. And I think that obviously the changes disrupted it and it changed the full team and you know that can happen. But I really, really thought we, we were looking looking really good. And I think this whole preseason we've looked really, really sharp. So um and and I think I mean Jota I think's improved already quite a bit for last season. I think he he's he's looked really, really, really strong. So I kinda wait for the game tonight actually. Um I wouldn't tell you my favourite memories of Big Arthur because I've done that on Friday and I, I rambled for ages about some of the, the funny stuff he's done. So go back and watch that. But but yeah, I, I think it's a really good test for us to get into the, the Champions League. And I think, as you say, I think we'll start to see um, not necessarily the strongest 11. Well, you made a good point, actually, when I was talking about strongest 11. I think Anch is our strongest 16. Aye. So I think they will rotate a bit. But I think we start to see the bones of the team that's likely to be, you know, the sort of main team, if you will. Um uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I, I, th- I think when I say that I didn't look forward to the Champions League is because it's always in the back of my mind that well, there's a chance that you could actually get an utter scalping in the Champions League. And um, and but I've never seen this team in the Champions League, and I really I really have to believe. I really, really have to believe that Ange Postacoglu can turn us into a European force and make the nights that we had under Brendan Rodgers and to the latter end of Neil Lennon's um, like a thing of the past. But I've still got things like Copenhagen, Ferris Varos and all of that fresh in my, em- in my memory. So mm-hmm. I'm all... Mm-hmm. I Bodo Glint as well. So I've all, uh, that's always in the back of my mind. I do feel a lot more comfortable going into the Europa League because I do think that is our level and that's mainly due to the fact that we play in Scotland. Aye, you get to the Champions League, but when was the last time you really had fun in the Champions League? Free each with Man City. That, 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 that was a decent night. So I'm all, I know that I'm not looking forward to the Champions League. I just always have a wee bit of doubt when we go into it. Paddy Laverty comes in as, as we just round up for this evening. Big Hartson was raging. I think he's talking about the game in Newcastle Blackburn. there, but 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 uh, uh, with Blackburn. Yeah, it was another Blackburn game. He was talking about about the, some of the tactics for the Blackburn players. Maybe All I'm right. Wrong. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure Hartson was was a bit fruity in there. Kind of nonsense, to be fair. Aye, that, that was seemed, poor, actually. That, that seems to be a thing. Well, good prep, good, good pre- preparation pre- for the SPFL starting. Pre-season games, eh? Studs Lanigan does remind me that Beardsley came on and he missed the penalty. Aye, that's true, he did. <laughs> <laughs> he did. And Brian Watt comes in. And no, I'm no, I'm no a blowhard and I, and I didn't want to take the fun completely out of football. But if there is a penalty the night, a genuine penalty, no a penalty is engineered. You have to let Big Arthur take it, don't you? I just want, I just want this to be a genuine game. Lads, has been utterly brilliant the day we've been on for. That's an hour and three minutes we've been actually on. Uh, overtime, Graham. I want overtime. You want overtime? Well, we'll speak to the gaffer, eh? <laughs> speak to the gaffer. I, I didn't sign the overtime sheets anymore. <laughs> uh, on the day, please like and subscribe this broadcast on the day that the BBC just basically became a groveling, sniffling Rangers podcast with a with an apology that they shouldn't have ever gave to the most despicable football club in world football, just behind Rapid, just in front of Rapid Vienna, just in front of Rapid Vienna. Uh, so we need you more than ever. So there's a launch for a state of mind in Edinburgh on Saturday. If you are in Edinburgh in the St James's Quarter, I'm going to be there doing some more performance stuff, if you liked what i done earlier on. Uh, Paul will be back this evening with some match day content. I don't know. I think he'll, he'll be starting. I think he'll be starting at half past four. I think he's going to start the match day content tonight. And everybody, 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 just dunny be bams to each other, eh? And we'll speak to you all later. <laughs>
Cheers.